Well, good day, folks. Welcome to the MBY Man channel. On today's video, I'm going to show you an excerpt from a DVD series called Focus on Trapping. It was designed here in Canada, and it was designed to teach people or show people the proper methods for trapping, how to do it, how to handle the fur, all of those things. Great information for the beginner. Also great for the experienced trapper that wants just a little bit of a refresher or some new ideas for sets or anything like that. If you haven't yet subscribed to the MB Wildman channel, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. We certainly do appreciate the support. And uh, if you like the videos, feel free to comment and I certainly would appreciate any support you got on the channel. So without further ado, here we go. Focus on trapping. The muskrat, like people who trap it, usually frequents regions with an abundance of aquatic vegetation. It settles wherever it finds a sufficient supply of plants to use as food and building materials for its den. I have often seen muskrat in swamps and marshy areas near lakes or slow-moving streams. Other muskrat dig burrows in banks or take over abandoned beaver houses. I have often seen muskrat in fall and spring sitting on mounds of earth, rocks or objects floating in the water. They may use these sites for eating, washing or marking out their territory. The old tree stump found by these two trappers, for example, looks like a perfect site for a trap. Oh yes, did you notice the droppings? There must have been a muskrat in the area recently. Now we know this is a good site. What kind of trap are we going to use? Did you guess right? They've opted for a drowning set. The trapper cuts a notch in the log to hold the trap, a number one and a half victor. It's a good idea to make a notch so the trap will sit level with the surface of the log and won't move. The trap may be placed a little above or below the water level. It doesn't really matter. However, the trap spring must be positioned well away from the muskrat's paws. This way, the animal won't shift the trap before reaching the trigger. The pan should be level with the jaws and the sides of the jaws should be parallel to the sides of the log. Otherwise, the trap, when sprung, may throw the muskrat's leg up in the air and you'll lose a good catch. Unfortunately, the old saying, you win some, you lose some, doesn't really apply to trapping. Believe me, there's no such thing as a lucky trapper, just a trapper who does his job well and leaves nothing to chance. Once the muskrat is caught, the trap should drag the animal to the side of the log on which the water is deepest. If the trap chain doesn't reach to a spot that is deep enough, lengthen it with some wire, then fasten it to a stake driven into the bottom of the stream. Our trappers have made sure there's enough water here. It has to be at least 60 centimeters deep to prevent the animal from returning to the surface. This method is called the drowning set. But this is somewhat of a misnomer, since the animal doesn't really drown. Water doesn't usually enter the lungs of an aquatic animal. When the muskrat is kept underwater by the weight of the trap, it goes into a coma and dies from oxygen deficiency and the buildup of carbon dioxide in its lungs.
thôi Once the trap is securely attached, remove any obstacles around it, and all you have to do now is drive the pole in firmly. The drowning system is an effective method if the water level around the trap remains fairly constant, but I don't advise using it where the water level varies because of rain or melting snow. These are floats. They are aptly named. The traps are attached to pieces of dry wood or natural rafts. Like a boat, a float isn't bothered by variations in the water level, as long as it's not subjected to low tide. This time, the trapper planed the log instead of cutting a notch into it. This makes a smooth base on which a 120 conibear trap is most likely to stay put. The trapper is using a 3-inch nail system to keep the traps in place on the float. You may have heard of it. First. Place two nails in a straight line and then position a third nail three or four centimeters from the center of the line formed by the first two. The nails will then form a triangle. Careful! Always place the jaws of the trap outside the nails or you won't have much of a harvest. The nails must hold the trap securely. Make sure, however, that the trigger remains quite sensitive so the trap isn't too hard to spring and don't test the trigger with your fingers. The trigger wires should cover as much area as possible between the jaws. If you think the muskrat might be able to pass through the trap without touching the trigger, place the wires further apart. And finally, don't forget to remove the safety hooks and attach the trap chain or all your hard work will be wasted. I've lost traps in the past because ice or floating debris pulled up my work. You won't have this problem if you make sure not to do things by halves. Anchor your float securely with a pole placed in the hollow part of the log. To make my traps even more effective, in the spring, I sometimes use a lure made from the muskrat's musk glands and a little glycerin. Why not add a bit of mud and grass as well? This gives the impression that creatures other than the brawny trapper have recently climbed up on the log to feed. Now the rats won't be able to resist. I like using floats and there are all sorts of variations. Like this trapper, I think it's a good idea to attach a crosswise piece of wood under the end of the log. And this little piece of wood acts as a stabilizer, keeping the float pointed in the same direction as the current. I place the floats a fair distance from the water's edge to prevent the trapped muskrat from clutching at or falling into branches on the bank. Sometimes I use the same 120 conibear traps on tree stumps or sloping trunks. I use the three nail system to fasten them to the wood, being very careful to place the trap outside the nails. If you think there may be significant variations in the water level, don't use this method. Your traps will be wasted. Three quick knocks and here's our trapper. Yes, you can also attach a victor trap to a float with a three centimeter finishing nail. It's best to use a number one or one and a half victor trap. These are heavy enough to drag the muskrat to the bottom of the stream. The notches at either end of the log should be made deep enough to hold an open trap. Use a nail to keep the trap steady, but make sure it won't prevent the trap from falling into the water when the animal springs it. To trap the animal properly, the jaws must be facing the same direction as the log. In other words, they must be parallel to the log, and the pan must be level to the jaws. I don't use bait with these traps. Carrots and turnips attract migratory birds, 
but even without bait, birds have a tendency to land on floats. To avoid catching one accidentally, just bend a stiff piece of wire into a circle and fasten it above the trap. If a bird decides to land on the log anyway, it won't touch the trap. It's best to attach this wire to the sides so the muskrat can still climb up either end. Attach the chains, keep the traps away from each other to avoid catching one muskrat in two traps, and finally, leave the site quietly. Most traps for muskrats are set in the water. And here's another one, the submarine trap. Submarine traps are usually made of galvanized screening with a two to three centimeter square mesh. This model has only one opening. Place the trap in the water at an angle. The screen over the entrance must appear slightly above the water while the lower part rests on the bed of the stream or river. This method cannot be used in all regions. Since the laws are constantly changing, it's important to check with your local authorities before using this technique. That way you'll avoid a lot of trouble. Fasten the trap to a stick. It should be fairly thin, so the muskrat won't be able to use it as a support and climb up on the trap instead of going inside. Position the trap by placing the ends of the stick on either bank of the stream. That's it. This is one of the easiest trapping techniques. The only problem is that the traps are rather large to carry around. Look, a big mosquito. Arrange some branches on either side of the trap as well. These obstacles force the muskrat to dive down into the trap. Bait is rarely used with submarine traps, although some trappers weave aspen shoots through the screen at the bottom of the trap when installing them under ice. Instead of luring muskrat into the trap, this technique is designed to catch them as they go by. Since one trap can catch a number of muskrat in a single night, I try not to leave them too long in one place to guard against over-harvesting the population. Here is another model from our trapper's collection of submarine traps, the two-door version. This is a kind of tunnel with black openings, which the muskrat takes for a channel. It is thus led to dive down into the trap. The best location for this set is in a channel barely wider than the trap. If you can't find a narrow enough spot, put the trap in the middle of a stream and use brushwood to block off the sides. Position this trap in the same way as the last one, but use two sticks this time. Fasten them at either end of the trap. Rest the sticks on the banks and you're done. Notice that this trap is placed in a horizontal position. At the end of each funnel, there's a swinging door that opens when the muskrat pushes on it to get in and then closes behind the animal. The door doesn't open from the inside. Make sure the trap is completely submerged to ensure a quick death for the muskrat. The top of the trap should be at least three centimeters below the surface when the water level reaches its lowest point. It's a good idea to make sure the trap is held securely by attaching it to a branch near the water's edge. This way, you know the trap will stay in place even if there's flooding. The branches arranged around the cage keep it in place in deep water, forcing the muskrat to dive into the cage. Before leaving the site, I always take one last look at the trap and make sure it's completely underwater. Before winter comes, I'll make one more trip to the place where the muskrat live in a sea of cattails and bulrushes. This mammal builds two types of houses. One is a dwelling house, and the other serves as a feeding area. These are similar in shape to a beaver lodge. They are not made of branches, however, but of cattails, bulrushes, dry or green, and water plants. The muskrat, or water rat, is very prolific. Its mating season begins quite late in the spring and continues until July or August. 
the female may produce 18 or 20 young a year in two or three litters. This high birth rate compensates for the natural death rate. It is estimated that approximately 87% of muskrat die of natural causes in their first year. Scarcely 2% reach the age of three. Trapping is the best means of controlling muskrat numbers and it protects them from the epidemics that often occur when the population becomes too large. Fall trapping keeps populations down to levels which are more likely to survive the winter. Spring trapping should stop as soon as you notice that shedding has begun and cuts appear on the hide. I assist in the management of muskrat on my land by monitoring the condition of the local population. In the fall, I check the ratio of young muskrat to adult females in my catches. If there are many young for each female, trapping procedures are judged to be good and the population healthy. If there are few young per female, I reduce my quota to give the muskrat a chance to multiply. Do you see this sight? There are too many fresh signs of muskrat here. Look, this trapper is using modern technology to mark the spots where he will set his traps so that he can locate them in this jungle of cattails when harvest time comes. It's not easy to find your way in this swamp. It's a wonder the muskrat don't lose their young. To find the underwater trails used by the muskrat to get to their houses or feeding areas, I test the ground around the house with my feet. You can feel the depressions made by the paths, which are somewhat like rabbit runways. Only these are underwater and a little harder to spot. Look, our trapper seems to have found one. He's going to use a 120 Connie Bear trap. The trapper is setting his trap. He has thought of everything. The trigger wires are placed well apart and the safety hooks have been removed. The trigger is at the bottom of the trap, pointing upwards. Good, now all he has to do is install it. To keep the trap in position, place two sticks through the springs and then drive them into the pond bottom. The trap must sit a few centimeters off the bottom so that nothing will interfere with its operation. As you can see, a good pair of gloves and boots help to get the job done. Setting the trap isn't very difficult, but getting to the site may pose problems. Now that we are here, we may as well set a second trap. Muskrat will take up residence just about anywhere as long as the habitat suits their requirements. Even the sound of a highway outside the door doesn't keep them awake. In fact, muskrat live quite happily close to man and his activities. The trapper is going to set his second trap at the house entrance. To find the entrance, walk around the house and test the ground with your foot to find a path leading up to it. When you found it, you might put a small stick in the opening just to make sure it should go right into the house. Position the trap as in the channel with two sticks inserted through the springs of a 120 Connie Bear trap. Here's what you'd see if you were a muskrat. The same technique can also be used at the entrance of a burrow. 
either in the fall or in the spring. Muskrat often dig burrows in riverbanks. The burrow entrances used most often are those found below the waterline. Notice the freshly cut cattail shoots floating at the mouth of this burrow. This is the unmistakable sign of the presence of muskrat. Elementary, you say. All you have to do is keep your eyes open. This is what a muskrat house looks like in the winter. In most areas, muskrat are very difficult to trap in the dead of winter. This is a good opportunity for you to rest up. But soon, as the days get longer and the sun's rays warmer, the sleepy muskrat trapper comes back to life. He senses spring in the air. And at this time of year, the ice is still strong enough to support a snowmobile's weight easily. The muskrats have been trapped under a thick layer of ice, very restricted in their movements for some time now. They're getting quite restless. At this time of year, their fur is at its prime. During the winter, life for the muskrat revolves around his house, which can be made out here. The burrow and feeding platforms, commonly called push-ups, which they build under the ice. Several muskrat live down there. Since the house is surrounded by a thick layer of ice, it is very difficult to find the entrances. The simplest way to set a trap at this time of year is to open up the house by cutting the top off until you find the inner chamber. Before installing the trap, carefully clean out the room. Remove any debris that could interfere with the trap's operations. Either a 120 conibear or a leg hole trap can be used. Since this chamber is large enough, our trapper has decided to use a conibear. A little bait, such as a piece of carrot, can be placed right on the trigger. There's one important advantage to this system. If you've forgotten your lunch, you can always take a bite of the carrot yourself. Set the trap right on the floor of the muskrat's chamber. Place it so that it faces the entrance as squarely as possible. To hold the trap in place, insert two stakes through the springs, as for the two sets we just saw. One of the two poles must be long enough to extend about a meter above the ice. Attach a bit of fluorescent tape to this pole. This way, you can find your traps easily and won't have to wander about the lake looking for them. Cover the house with clumps of earth, ice, and snow so that it won't freeze inside the room. It's very important not to damage the house needlessly, even when you remove your traps for the last time. It's to the advantage of every self-respecting trapper to protect the resource he or she lives on. Trails are routes the muskrat normally travel along. Throughout the trapping season, muskrat use a regular network of trails or channels to get from one place to another. The trails look like furrows in the grassy bank or the muddy pond bottom. These routes are also found under the ice, but naturally are much harder to locate. They are ideal locations for traps. They also wind through grass, farm ditches, culverts, streams and gullies that connect two bodies of water. As always, when trapping muskrat, place the trigger in the lower part of the 120 Conny Bear trap, pointing upwards. This way, when the animal's head touches the trigger, the trap will strike its vital parts. As well, with the trigger placed down below, the trap's dog will be less likely to damage the pelts. To keep the trap in place, Slide two small sticks diagonally through the springs and between the lower jaws. Drive them firmly into the ground. If you're setting the trap underwater, place a small stick across the top to force the muskrat to dive down. This trap works on a very simple principle. Put one or more traps across a channel. No bait or lure is required. Choose a narrow spot and block off the sides so the animal can't go around the trap. This trap works the same way as a snare set on a rabbit runway. The muskrat's way of life is a good example of adaptation to an aquatic environment. The muskrat has lips that close behind its incisors so that, like a beaver, it can gnaw underwater without swallowing any water. When I notice the first fresh bite marks on the animal's hide in the spring, I stop trapping. These marks indicate that mating is about to begin. 
Just a piece of advice. A 110 conibear will also do the trick, but only where the water is deep enough to submerge the animal. On the ground, the 110 does not have enough striking force. The 110 conibear is the same size as the 120, but has only one spring. I check these traps faithfully, particularly when they're above water, where my catch is accessible to predators and scavengers, including the two-legged variety.